it's fine. No, it's fine. Hello everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Camille Meir and I'm on the events team at the bookstore and I'm thrilled to be welcoming Jenny Offal to present the paperback release of her novel Weather in conversation with Diane Cook. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one we are about to see have become bright spots in our days. So I want to give a huge thanks to Jenny and Diane for joining us this evening. So just quickly to housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have a question or any feedback about the event, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button where I will be posting a link to purchase tonight's novel. Um, so please keep an eye out for that link and make sure to click and buy. One caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to solve them as quickly as possible. Community Bookstore will be continuing our virtual series across the winter and the spring, so please make sure to head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One event that I want to point out is next Thursday. We're thrilled to present a discussion of Tove Ditlevson's The Copenhagen Trilogy with Hermione Hobie and Katie Kitamura, part of our ongoing series with the New York Review of Books. Registrations for that event are live now, so please check it out on our website and register. Um, so now just a little bit about our authors and we'll get started. Jenny Offal is the author of novels Last Things and Department of Speculation, which was shortlisted for the Folio Prize, the Penn Faulkner Award, and the International Dublin L Literary Award. She lives in upstate New York and teaches at Bard College and in the Low Residency Program at Queen's University. Diane Cook is the author of the novel The New Wilderness and the story collection Man vs. Nature, which was a finalist for the Guardian First Book, the Believer Book Award, and the LA Times Art Side and Bomb Award for First Fiction. Her writing has appeared in Harper's, Tin House, Granta, and other publications, and her stories have been included in the anthologies Best American Short Stories and the O. Henry Prize Stories. She was the recipient of a 2016 fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. Jenny and Diane, thank you so much. The virtual stage is now yours. Thanks for having us. Um, thank you. I'm glad to get to do this event tonight. Um, Community Bookstore is one of my favorite bookstores. Um, it's one of the ones I miss the most browsing around in. Um, I used to live in that neighborhood. Um, but thank you guys for all coming virtually tonight. And um, I think I'm going to start out by just reading a little bit um, from the beginning of weather. And then we'll dive into chatting. Um, so the main character is a uh, works in a university library, and so it begins there. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages, and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can be described only by a Japanese word. Bucket of black paint, it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He's been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips, and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental, he told me. Minor, but instrumental. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing right now making money, it said. The man in the shabby suit does not want his library fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our institution. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to a quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccinations and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? Asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. A time traveler walks into the bar. <laughs> On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she tells me. I pick out one for my son, Eli. 
It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. He will keep it, though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother's late, and this after I took a car service so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot Henry, he's drenched. No coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature, but their radiance was faint and fainter still beneath the terrible music. I try to get him warmed up quickly. Soup, coffee. He looks good, I think, clear-eyed. I eat three pieces of bread while he tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewers and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home, made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. But were they happier, I ask him? Did they get more done in a given day? Thank you. I love, uh, I love how many places you go with your writing. Um, let me just start by saying, uh, I'm a big fan of your work and the first time I read Department of Speculation, it felt like I'd never read anything like it before. And I tried to put my finger on why. And I feel like I read uh, writing about your books or um, reviews, and they always talk about this, like the word vignette always comes up or kind of dispatches. But I feel like there's, I wonder what you think of that if you read what people write about your work and if you think that they understand what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'd say, you know, so, so, some seem to understand and, and some not, and maybe some willfully not. I mean, I think um, sometimes I get, uh, I get accused of writing a, a novel like a Twitter feed. Um, and, and that really isn't what I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm, Obviously. I'm not, I'm trying sort of to do the opposite, which is to not believe that my first thought is my best thought mm -hmm. <laughs> and to, to, to keep things for a while and see if they last. So in that way, it, it feels different than um, the brief, uh, exhilarating, but terrifying uh, three months that I was on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but I can understand, I mean, it is, it is definitely in these discrete um, paragraphs. Um, some of them are longer than, you know, a fragment and some of them are shorter, but it's meant to, um, it's just closer to the way that thought moves. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's always what I'm trying to capture. Yeah, it seemed to me, yeah, agreed. And and so the, the word vignette always seems strange to me, like it didn't get at what you were doing. Um, and it seemed to me that you were like capturing time, like how you say um, how thought works, but also like capturing what a life feels like looked at, if you like looked back from like the very near future, like, <laughs> so it's it's not this um, cataloging of like the big moments, it's this, it's, it's what pull, like stays in your brain like five seconds longer um, from these like smaller moments that actually make up a big life. Um, and with this book, you do it, it feels like you're doing it with all of the characters. They're all struggling and transitioning in some way. Um, and they all have such different things going on. And then Lizzie seems to be the center that they're whirling around. And then she is kind of arriving at this idea of climate change. Um, and I found it so fascinating 
that they all are whirling under this one big umbrella. And I wondered if you knew when you started writing if you were that you were going to write about climate and environmental issues or if you were just writing and it kind of appeared well i i knew that i was going to write about dread <laughs> and and i guess about the anticipation of something that you can't yet see but I think when I was first very, the very, very beginnings of it, I think I was writing more about aging and about like um, losing people in your life. Um, and so I think I started there more. I was also thinking about um, how many people have lives that aren't exactly what they imagined they were gonna be, um, but they're often still very interesting and full um, complex lives and and sometimes in in our kind of hurry to be like oh live your dreams or whatever that sort of thing that people like lizzie who who's kind of um ended up by default in the life that she she is in um but she's also i remember i came across this description of the monk um thomas merton somewhere and it said that he was permanently curious and i just wanted to have her have that quality so that the people around her, even though she's just has a little glimpse into their lives, um, that she was interested in them. And then as I myself started to, um, I think I got interested in the climate element because I read about um, Paul Kingsnorth, um, who's a novelist as well, but who was known just as an environmentalist then saying that he was just gonna walk away from all these years of doing that because there was no, um, no hope anymore. And he was tired, as he said, of being a priest who didn't believe in God anymore. And I remember thinking, I want to write about, I want to write about that. I want to write, write about someone like that too. So those were sort of the beginning points, but then I fell down the like doomer climate hole and, and it became more and more something that I wanted to write about. I also wanted to write about like, I, I couldn't figure out how to write about it because I felt like it was going to be either an apocalyptic novel, which I'm not really suited to write, or it was gonna be a boring, super wonky novel, in which case someone better at those things should write it. Um, I've seen you talk about it as a pre-apocalyptic novel. Um, and I wonder if you could just explain that and to me, to me, that makes a lot of sense because, it, you know, it can't, it's can't be this apocalyptic novel, and and I'll get to this other point later. Um, it's not a hopeless novel either. There's like, even though you end the novel with this little website that people can go to, like almost as if you think maybe they are ending the book hopeless. Like it feels to me <laughs> like there's like a ton of hope in it and a ton of kindness. Um, but it, I wonder if you can talk about the pre-apocalyptic because it, it does, you're capturing something that's in motion, but we're not there yet, but we're, we're too far gone to like go yeah. back. Yeah, I think I felt like I'd, I'd read, you know, um, a fair number of like uh, post-apocalyptic novels or, just after apocalyptic uh, apocalypse novels that had to do with climate or nature and um and i was wondering i mean there's a way in which i i noticed in myself that when i read those books no matter how much i liked them it allowed me to feel that it wasn't here yet um and and so i was like well what what would it be like if it was here because of course um that is the way that the climate change is working it, in all sorts of different places. Um, it feels like in other parts of the world, yes, we're living through the apocalypse and then some other places are more sheltered and not feeling that yet. And I was also really interested in this idea that I just remembered from some comparative religion class I took in college that um, this scholar of, of, of religion said that in all the myths he'd read, he'd never come across a myth of a slow apocalypse. Hmm. Um, and that's why we could all understand the atomic bomb in a certain way, because that was, um, that fit with our kind of ideas of, of how the world will end. So I just, I, I kept thinking like, what would that look like to be um, a slower 
um, understanding about it. And then how do you come out on the other side of that and, and not um, preach? <laughs> how do you remain like understanding that um, this character can still be um, imperfectly understanding and just as complicit as, as everyone else is? So I, I sort of felt like I just didn't want the book to um, turn out to be kind of self-righteous at the end. Like she had seen the light, but I also kind of wanted her to see the light. So that was a tricky, tricky thing to maneuver. I thought you did it amazingly well. And she, in part because she is juggling all of these other lives in her orbit. Um, and they all have their own struggles. Like it feels like everyone is like, on this trajectory to fail a little bit, even, or they, whether they do or don't in the end, they are, they're kind of like falling down, whether they get up again, they may get up again, but they're in this like moment of falling down. You have the brother who's trying so hard to be clean and even like enters this new phase of life and then it all kind of falls apart. And then even his wife this begins to fall apart. And, um, but it, the, the, it's all like this kind of, it's all about their immediate lives. And then Lizzie, because she's taking in all of their like thoughts and feelings and ideas. And like you said, all the patrons at the library, she's got these like little bits of, of them too, that she's the one that can see the rest of the world. Like she's the one that can see this thing that they're all spiraling towards, even though they ne aren't necessarily able to see it as clearly as she can. I thought that that, I don't know, I thought that that was so perfect that she could hold all of that. Um, and she seemed like the perfect character to do that. Well, and I think she can't really, she can't really see what she herself is spiraling towards, but right. she, she could see, which is, I think, um, I talked about this idea a little bit in, in my last novel that like nobody gets the crack up that they expect. So it's like, you know, you don't, you don't see what, what thing is coming towards you. Um, that's been one of the many kind of um, startling and, and um, harrowing things I think about the pandemic is just watching all the different ways lives can fall apart um, and, um, and all the ways people are sort of valiantly struggling. Um, um, and sometimes it's more immediate and sometimes it's more of like a chronic thing. But I wanted, um, I guess I just wanted this, I sometimes think about, um, like Octavia Butler in The Parable of the Sower, she talks about that character having like hyper empathy. And I think that um, that quality of sort of easily slipping into other people's lives and problems, it, it maybe makes you a, a good friend and s sort of makes it also sort of terrible to live your own life. Um, and I feel, cause you'd never put, you never lay any of it down. I mean, in, in, in weather, you know, she's constantly worrying about the, the car service guy. She doesn't even know him. Um, and uh, I, I had one of my students who was much more um, better prepared for the world than I am and not so <laughs> porous. And, and she was like, why would you even think for a minute about like, why would you? <laughs> and I was sort of like, oh, yeah, I took that detail from my own life. <laughs> <laughs> the part where I was like, oh, I don't want to use that car service, but like, oh, that guy said they're going out of business. <laughs> You're, you are the only person using that car service. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess I was trying to figure out, like, if you make a character that porous, then what happens? And, and also with the climate stuff, I feel like if, if so many, there's so many people who are like Lizzie, I think, who are caretakers for in one way or the other. And, and when you're, asked to sort of like engage with climate things and climate um, chaos, it feels like, how can you worry about that too? Like, how are you expected to like worry about the non-human world as well as the human world? Yeah, um, it's not possible. It does, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's possible, um, but it, it, it was interesting to read the book because it, it felt like it was somewhat of a guide um, in that it, you can't make it your entire life. Like you can't live it, breathe it and become the change, you know, and, and the solution, but you can uh, see it, 
right? And so like Lizzie sees it and by the end, that feels really monumental or it did to me anyway. Um, I felt like it was a book that had done something because she had seen it and told me about it or told me, told me about this, like took the veil back. Like, like you, I think you said earlier, um, like it's, we are all in it right now. It's just, you know, it might not be affecting us personally in this moment, but it will, and it's happening elsewhere. Um, we're already in it, but it takes the right person to tell us about it or to show it to us. And in that way, like she made it seem not hopeless, even though she's full of dread. And I definitely was full of dread at various points in the book. Um, but actually more because she seemed so put upon by other people, like uh, with the brother, I kept, <laughs> I kept wanting to be like, just, you just gotta walk away, <laughs> just walk mm -hmm. away, Lizzie. And, but she couldn't, and I understood that. Um, but she brings something, I think she brings something to the discussion of climate that made me feel like I could finally see it and hold it in a way that was productive and not in a way that felt like, well, fuck it, you know, we're doomed. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that I also just, I was, there was this book that was really important to me when I was writing um, Weather, and it's a book of sociology called States of Denial with a very arduous subtitle, uh, looking away from suffering and atrocity. <laughs> um, but it talks about like, what does it mean to half know something and and he came up with this phrase, twilight knowing. And I kept thinking about that, that for so long, I myself had been in a kind of twilight knowing state where I knew that more, that things were worse than I thought. But I also didn't really want to um, investigate that because what would that mean? It would either mean that, uh, that I felt fatalistic or it would mean that I needed to um, act totally different than I acted. And, and, and both those things felt really overwhelming. And I guess um, I felt more filled with dread kind of in the middle of the novel because mm -hmm. that was when I was going down all the sort of in the prepper world and the, you know, uh, gather your, all those people that just, you know, some of them that just uh, did a siege on the Capitol. I, I, right. was, uh, I was in those websites many years ago, <laughs> worried about it, thinking, oh, oh dear. Uh, we don't want the tree of liberty to be watered with the blood of patriots. No, no. <laughs> um, but as I got farther into it, I think I just became much more interested in the idea of how change that's happened, um, that's been progressive, has been collective. And that, that that as soon as you kind of glimpse that to me, that is hopeful. And that's why the book, um, you know, the last part of the book is, is actually the election, um, the second election, um, which was weird because I had to, that was my one example of trying to write speculative fiction because I wrote it a year ahead of, a uh, year and a half ahead of uh, actually it happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, I, I was reminded, I, re, I read it, you know, closer to when it was first released. And then I reread it in anticipation of talking to you. And, um, and since, you know, the, the Capitol uh, riot, and I was like struck again by Lizzie's conversation with Will, like the guy she sees at the bar who is a photojournalist in, in war zones, um, that he, he points to like it's like you pointed to this schism in in the in society before i think most people understood that we were kind of at this point where he says you say something like so are we at war or at peace or she is, lizzie says something like are we at war or peace and he says we're like right in the moment before mm -hmm. and that felt like oh i recognize that place now because i think we've seen it um, yeah. So it's like you had a climate, you have wrote a climate book, but then you also wrote about <laughs> dissatisfaction in <laughs> in America. Well, I you know I feel like for a while I was like the the person that was the the climate doomer at your party, and then I became the person who was like 
the fascism doomer. <laughs> it was like, I think, you know, and I kept, I, I, I started buying the book on tyranny by Timothy Snyder and like uh, forcing it upon people and leaving it in like um, in the train station and stuff for people to find. And I think it was because, you know, the authoritarianism scholars were just, have been very, and they're rather sober types. They've been very alarmed early on in the same way that the climate didn't, people always say, oh, people have always been talking about the end of the world, but it's just not the scientists who are the ones like with the end is nigh sign until mm -hmm. this. And so I think I was, um, in both those instances, it was the fact that it was so hard for these people to communicate um, urgency because they were scientists or academics that made me, um, you know, how as a writer, you sometimes get that feeling of like, oh, this is like a, this is like a dense, complex knot of like of, of feeling and language and, and I'm curious about it. And that's kind of how I felt when I first started writing about that. Um, but I also felt like I didn't want to bring the, I mean, what, what he says, what Will the journalist says about, um, about what it feels like before war, um, as he says, it's a physical feeling. And, and she says like hackles, um, like a dog's hackles going up. And I got that idea from reading this amazing um, article by uh, the writer Sasha Heman, Alexander Heman, um, that came out right after Trump was elected called uh, Stop Making Sense, How to Write in the Age of Trump. And he talks about what it was like in Bosnia um, in the very early days before they knew it was going to be war and how he started to look up and suddenly he would think to himself, that would be a place a, a sniper could be. And he didn't even know why he was thinking it. Um, but he said that his body knew before his mind did. And I think with a lot of things, um, with a, and, and a, a lot of things that we register on some level um, in our less conscious places, and then they kind of play out like a dream, like all the, I, I was so interested for a while in like all the zombie stuff and the zombie apocalypse, like no one wanted to talk about the climate apocalypse, but the zombie apocalypse was everywhere, including in like FEMA, like, <laughs> posters, it'd be like, get your go bag ready in case the zombie apocalypse comes. <laughs> You're like, no, a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> um, I wanted to jump back to writing and, and how you write a little bit. Um, I remember when Department of Speculation came out, there was like, there was like a lot of talk about how it had been there had been many years between your last, the book before that and this book and, and uh, Department of Speculation. And then this one feels like then it came out pretty quickly. And I wondered, uh, like, did something change in your, the way you write or did, was there like something in you that felt more, I don't know, urgent or like in stride, like you'd, you'd gotten back into something? Um, well, a couple things happened. I mean, um, the first thing was that someone gave me money oh. to write a book. So instead of teaching uh, at like four different places, adjuncting, I just, I just had a, I just didn't have to work as much. I was able to write more. Um, and I think also my daughter got older and the, the sort of intensity of the early years, um, meant that I had, um, you know, cause I used to only write except for little bits in the summer and on, um, yeah, vac vacation from, from teaching. Um, and, but I also think that, so, so this one, I think for me, it was super fast. It was like five years, six years. <laughs> um, and uh, it's funny because that doesn't please people that that's fast. They're like, what, what how, why is that the fast one? I um, think, I think it's fast. I think it's like <laughs> totally the right amount of time to spend yeah. on a book and I published my last book when you did too. So <laughs> yeah, no, I actually noticed we were, we were, uh, we were in the same club with that. I like it. I, yeah. I feel like it's so sort of like, a, I, be I believe in the six year, uh, class of gap. 2014 class of my, 2020, but I've definitely had to, I've had to, I've had people say like, well, you worked so long on this book. So <laughs> I, I'm with you anyway, go on. Yeah, no, but I mean, I don't, I, I, um, I don't think I'll ever be, 
a fast writer. Um, I admire people that are, you know, there's some really good writers that are fast writers, but I'm, I'm just not one of them. And I think it's partly because I don't, because I'm trying to do this um, idea where I'm sort of juxtaposing things that I sense go together, uh, that they feel like they have some kind of magnetic pull, but I'm not entirely sure. I have to let them sit for a while to see if I was wrong, <laughs> you know, or, or see if it becomes clearer to me. And so it's it, in the beginning, there's a lot of intuition and there's a lot of um, kind of reading away from the thing I'm supposed to write about. I read really, really far away into other disciplines. Um, and then I kind of go back to see and, and slowly the more personal story starts to percolate alongside whatever is the intellectual interest that's going on at the time. And did you always write like that? Um, like, did, was it always that kind of endeavor? And did it always end up looking the way it does on the page, like formally? Well, my first novel doesn't look that way. I mean, it looks, it looks like a regular um, way people still write novels <laughs> um, <laughs> all these years in. Um, and, uh, but it, it did have that kind of, um, like I was really interested in, there's a lot of natural science stuff in it. There's a lot of stuff about extinction and, um, and there's a lot of like encyclope encyclopedia of the unexplained stuff that I was really into at the time. So there's a lot of nested stories, but it was with department that I decided I wanted to experiment more with um, what you could do on the page just with the negative space. Um, and with, you know, just like obviously in, in poetry, there's the sense of the line um, and, and what originally, you know, it was where you would take the breath, but you, you see all these writers who do really interesting things, poets with the line. And I was just sort of thinking about that, like as the sentence and the paragraph, what does it mean to, to remember that those are your tools too? Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it became more like obviously strange looking on the page, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. um, it's funny that you say that about your first book, because I had this feeling that, I mean, reading these two, um, yeah, that we, like so many writers, myself included, like, feel like either because we want to, or we feel like we need to like wrestle the story into a, a thing that looks like a book, like a thing that looks like this novel, and that your writing, to me anyway, fills it it's like this fog that fills in all of the space that it's given or it's it makes its own space in some way um and I think maybe part of that is was seeing all of that white um white space on the page when I read Department of Speculation like it we're like trained to see that as empty space but in fact like it reading that book was like this really expansive uh experience for me and i think that's because because of both how it looked and like what those words ended up doing just formally not i mean not outside of the page itself but they're doing that same kind of work like emotionally as they are visually if that makes mm -hmm. sense um well thank you that's very kind i i think <laughs> that i i think that the reason i'm so interested in in the white space is because i just feel like there's always been this kind of idea, especially mostly with the American novel for a long time that like an ambitious novel is like a big encyclopedic novel. And, um, and I was just interested in like, what if you didn't wear your ambition on your sleeve? Like, what if you, what if you did, I mean, I'm always joking with my friend Lydia about like things being called a tiny luminous gem, um, you know, <laughs> and, and like all, you know, all those kind of things that, that uh, mostly women and gay writers get, <laughs> you know, the luminous, the luminous and the gem. Um, but, you know, no one ever says like a big baggy, but I'm always amazed when some novel, someone will say that it is a, a, a sprawling, uh, flawed masterpiece or something. I'm just like, <laughs> these, these words don't go together. So I was interested in what, what could, could I, could I look for the essential? Could I know more and put only what felt like essential to me? And sometimes what feels essential to me is like basically the equivalent of a joke. You know? So, um, so it might not always be 
um, noticeably uh, profound, but it feels like it's true to the the character, and um, and so I tried to do that with weather um, as well because I wanted it's a lot more outward facing. There's a lot more characters, but I wanted there to be this sense of. I guess I'm just like a big believer in the glancing blow, you know, like <laughs> I like the kind of, then you're off. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> yeah. The spar. Um, I, well, I love the humor in them and, and I love the approachability and I don't mean to just fangirl on it. I, I wanted to like talk about uh, what it's doing, but um, I do love that it, it's so approachable. Um, you, I don't, I think maybe we were just talking or maybe this was at the beginning of this conversation. My brain is so fried from life right now. Um, I hear but you. you said it, it sounds like a Twitter feed or it reads like a Twitter feed. And there was this one note I did take in when I was reading this, that it was like the most amazing text you could ever get. Right. Like, because, <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment, like, because it's so approachable and because it's so approachable, it, like you're allowed to look for things in it. Like you don't, I don't read it like, mm -hmm. oh, well that was simple. Mm -hmm. I like, because it's approachable, it seems like it's again with that space, like it's opening space up for me to like really see what's happening in it anyway. Well, uh, I mean, I think in this so-called, you know, experimental writing, which I don't think anyone's really ever agreed that that's a great term, <laughs> um, but, um, but I mean, a lot of it feels, I think, quite daunting to people. Um, and I, I, I saw, I mean, I, I like a lot of that stuff that people don't like, and I love to just force it uh, down my students' throats and things. But I understand that like, not everyone is gonna go for Thomas Bernhard and it's all one sentence. And it's like the literature kind of, of exhaustion, <laughs> like getting to the end of it and the end of this like uh, misanthropic, um, tone, you know, but I also feel like, I, I think that's fascinating too, when people fill up space that way, but I've, I realized that it's not the way my brain works. My brain likes to put a lot of different things together that seem associatively to go together, but I'm not sure why yet. Mm -hmm. and, and in that way, it's very, um, it's like the last remnants of like growing up in a religious household. There's like some mystical element of like that certain things seem to me to have like something sublime about them or or, or at least something that is very um you know it's like Rilke's always talking about that things will speak to you you know that they, and, and so certain things just speak speak to me and I don't know yet what I'm going to do with them and so I just put them aside and hope that <laughs> I will figure it out later. And often it's quite late, you know, it's late in the game mm -hmm. that I know. And a lot of it has to, you know, go. Um, and then I'm always hoping, I'm, I was joking to my friend the other day that I'm like a depression era writer because I write so little that I'm like always trying to save like a little bit of string, you know, like I'll be like, oh, I described that bike ride, but there's no bikes in this book, like, you know, like <laughs> see if I could use it later, but it never gets used. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, and I, a lot of, a lot of department just came from, I had a little baby and I didn't, um, I couldn't write the way I used to, which was mm -hmm. in kind of a bingy, write a lot and then don't write for months and then write mm -hmm. a lot. So I right. may be familiar with that as someone that also. I has, am now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, um there's a question in the Q and A that uh, is touches upon something we were just talking about, which is your humor. Um, and the person writes, uh, "How do you balance humor and anxiety in your novels? Do you feel the two sentiments sharpen each other?" Mm. Wow, good question. Um, I feel, yeah, I guess I do feel that because I feel like, um, you know, there's there's some very strange writing you can read about humor, about like why, what makes things funny. And it's, it, it, it's, it's very much like, you know, some technician trying to take apart jokes, but it is also um, of course about the surprise in, in most humor, there's some surprise that you've expected things to go one way and then there you get a different answer. And so I feel like, um, 
I'm often noticing that the texture or tone of a section of the novel has been one way for a while. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel like um, it needs to go in another way and it needs to have another um, tone come in. So, you know, um, it's like the Pixies quiet, quiet, loud. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, that's been very quiet for a long time or that's been really loud. And the humor sometimes is, is that kind of juxtaposition. Like it's to, um, especially when it's really deadpan, it's to like maybe stop the darkness for a moment um, because that's really what humor is best for. And that's why, you know, EMTs and all those kind of people have like really dark senses of humor often. Um, and then with the anxiety, I think it's about that being, my characters tend to be a little less anxious and a little more depressive. Um, and, you know, all the depressives know that when they did the studies, they found that they had the most realistic view of the world. <laughs> the depressed. So of course, but, um, but climate does have a certain um, edginess that is more representative of anxiety, I think. And, and that's like a little bit of a darting movement that comes in and out of the narrative, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I recently discovered that anxiety and depression, like I think they're, they slide over one another mm -hmm. in a way that I'd never noticed. Like, I think I always defined anxiety as one thing. And then I realized, oh, it's, it's actually many things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the pandemic has helped me understand anxiety as well as depression, <laughs> which I was more, more acquainted with. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, <laughs> pandemic. Thanks, pandemic. Um, yes. So. Um, I was really curious uh, who would be in your doomstead. Mm. You can be in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> Who would be in my doomsday? Well, I mean, the main thing or about- like, And why? Like, what are you, what would you yeah. look for? Um, well, I, I found a really like fascinating thread, you know, a couple of years ago when I was writing this book that was all about like professions you should, it said, if you don't have anything that would make someone choose you for a survival group, you should like pick up these professions. And it listed all the things that people would want. And I was like, wow, that's not me at all. Like none of them were things that I was good at, but it said that you could train to be a herbalist or you could, um, you could learn how to blacksmith um, or, or, and then it said, this was like at the very farthest down, it said you could be a storyteller. And I was like, I feel like I'm going to get the smallest portion of food in the doomstead, but um, you know, okay. Um, but I thought to myself, oh, I'll be the doomstead librarian because I had ordered so many, um, books about frightening scenarios like the, mm -hmm. some of them were just like for peace corps so it's like when there is no dentist when there is no doctor um and then i have like these weird books that are all like spy secrets <laughs> things like that that you have to and um and then of course all those kind of back to the land um 70s books where everybody you know all these poor people's fathers or mothers were like let's go build our own cabin out on uh, out on the land <laughs> you know and then like years later their children are like yeah that was some cold winters dad um so yeah but i think in my own doomstead i would mostly want um i would want funny people and handy people and kind people <laughs> um, because i feel like everything else you know, you can't do without a handy. I'm married to a handy person, thank God. Or I would, I, we live out in the country and like, I don't even know how to make a fire. Like even to this day, I keep every Christmas, I'm like, can you make a laminated sheet that explains to me how to make a fire and then I will make it because I'm afraid I'm going to do it wrong. So you can't have a doomstead without people that are a little bit handy. You can't have everybody right. just be like, here, here's a book. <laughs> That's what I would be like. So, um, but I, I like that you mentioned kindness because I feel like the book is so kind. Um, like it's full of these easy to overlook kindnesses between the characters. Um, like for example, when uh, the brother, um, Henry, right? Is mm -hmm. it Henry? Um, like Lizzie gets an email from his ex at that point um, 
and it, she's clearly like kind of going off the deep end and, and she tells Henry about it or has him read it. And his only response is she's a good person, mm -hmm. even though they've been through all of this stuff and mm -hmm. like little moments like that. I just felt this like huge warmth coming from the book. And I think that's partly why I, I ended it almost not, um, not, I wasn't down or hopeless because there was within between all of these people in their relationships, mm -hmm. there was so much kindness and that made it seem like, well, then something will happen, like something can happen. Um, and so when I got to the, um, yeah, at the, you end the book, um, in case someone, anyone hasn't read it, um, you end the book and then the next page, there's a website that you can go to and it's uh, obligatory, hopeful. Obligatory note of hope. Yeah. Note of hope. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you, like when you realized that you were going to put that there and why in the course of writing. Yeah. I mean, I still sometimes wonder if I should have put that there. Um, it was, <laughs> it was a little bit of, um, I think as I was reading all this stuff that was, was really dark about climate. I also came across some stuff that was really interesting of what people were doing. Um, often it was kind of small scale um, in, a, in a way that maybe we don't always look for or notice. Um, and so I wanted a place that could hold that. I also was, um, I kept finding these sort of awesome little passages that were about people who'd like lived through the siege of Leningrad or, or, uh, or some other wartime thing or wh what they did. And I was just, I wanted like a little repository, I guess, of, of, of all these ways. Because one of the things that's a little bit odd about the prepper culture as any kind of response to um, climate or any other disaster is that it, it's all about like kind of going it on your own with your own, your own clan. Um, but that's just not how humans have ever made it through things ever, <laughs> you know? And so I wanted like somewhere to put that. And I wanted, the reason I made it as something you had to go to was I felt like, um, there's a joke early on in the book where the woman, Sylvia, who's like the environmentalist podcaster, she says, oh, I can't talk right now, I'm writing an article and I have to put in the obligatory note of hope. And, you know, I did notice that when I was reading all this environmental stuff, I was like, oh God, it's so dark. It's so, oh, where's that weird uplift? <laughs> you know, it feels very like creakily done, you know, uh, but if we all immediately come together and do this immediately at the same time, then we could stave off disaster. You're like, oh. but it was clearly like put at the end of every article. So I just was like, for people that, end this book and they want some idea of what they might join that's a collective thing I wanted some conduit but I also wanted it to not be embedded in the book so that if you're not interested in that you didn't have to go to it so the ending right. is really in in a way it's more like a it's meant to be more like a notes for the book yeah you know, like the last line is the last line of the novel and then oh yeah for sure I I I definitely read it that way. I knew what it was doing. It was like what it was trying to do. And I knew that it was separate. Um, I'm curious though, when you said sometimes you don't think you should have put it in there. Why do you? Well, I had all these like middle of the night manic ideas that I was going to like constantly, you know, like add new things to it. And what, and, um, and I did, you know, I, I then didn't do any of it. Um, partly because <laughs> you know, I don't know how to do web design. <laughs> so like actually going in, I didn't really know how to do it. But also because the plan w was, this was all in February when the book came out last year. I was like still collecting things. I had all these like tips for trying times, all these, I was going to change things. And then it was just like the pandemic hit. And I was like, the last thing I'm going to do is like update an obligatory note of hope. Because everything felt very... I don't know. It's one of the reasons I didn't write anything about the pandemic when people asked me to. I felt like this is such a, you know, evolving tragedy and like these, uh, like some people may have a way to respond immediately, but like I only knew how to take care of like 
friends and neighbors and family that were around me. I didn't have any bigger um, ideas. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I, lo I loved it as an artifact of the book. I mean, that's how I saw it, uh, mm -hmm. this other thing. And I, I did wonder, are you gonna like update it or? Well, I think I might put in the, I, I really had fun doing the tips for trying times that were all these, um, a lot of them are like oral history accounts. And, the, and um, so I, I have a whole bunch more of those. I think I'm gonna do that. And I think I'm maybe gonna take away the, um, I was also like a little on my kick of like, oh, fascism's coming, fascism coming. Let's talk about people of conscience. You know? <laughs> and that might be, um, I might feel less, slightly less urgent about that now. Cause I feel like many, many others have, have rung that bell for us. Yeah, uh, better than I have. Um, someone in the chat wants to know, um, can you share any thoughts about trusting your voice? Mm -hmm. When I read your work, I hear you, your or a voice more clearly than I do in many other novels. And I'm interested in experiences writing when you didn't trust your voice and why or how you know when you should, etc. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole novel not trusting my voice before department, uh, and, um, and it just felt, it felt kind of dead. And I was, it was cause I was writing, was trying to write a different way than I write. I was trying to write, um, uh, even though I wasn't like letting the, I wasn't following intuition. I was sort of just like, I don't, I analytically trying to figure out how to write a book. And what I ended up writing was kind of like a, it felt like a pastiche of my own writing in my own style. Um, and so th it was kind of devastating because it was so bad, I felt like. And um, and I thought, I just don't know how to write anymore. And um, and then I guess what really just helped me was like talking to, mostly talking to a friend who's a poet who just kept saying, going back to the idea of like, all right, what's one thing? What's one word even that f that you want to take out of that? And it kept going back to these smaller and smaller elements. And I realized like um, that I felt something again when I wrote. And so for me, I guess when I start feeling that, um, that dead feeling when I'm writing, um, I don't always stop writing, but I tend to stop writing like hard things. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes then like switch to researching mode. If I don't feel at least like a little bit of, um, you know, uh, feeling, it feels like an alertness, to be honest. Like, it feels like if I don't, if I don't feel that and I can just feel that I'm writing, cause you know, at a certain point, you know, whatever you can, you can do a workmanlike scene, you know, I can, I can, I can write a half-assed <laughs> epiphany, you know, like, <laughs> they've got to get from point A to point B. You know, it's like Joy Williams said, once you know how to do any, and anything, it, in your writing, then it's a trick and you can't do it again. And that's always haunted me. Like, oh God, I hope that's not true. But you know, sometimes you can tell you're, you're, you're doing a, a trick more or less. And, and when I feel that, I, I go back to the last point where something felt uh, real to me or where I liked the sentence even, or the image. And then I, I cut everything that comes after it and put it in the, like under the black line of badness where I <laughs> drop things. And then I go back to there and I try to start, even if it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm supposedly writing about, I, I go back to that. When it's really working, um, what does it feel like? Like, to um, you? Yeah. Uh, you know, it feels like you're doing the combination on a lock and, and you, you got it right. You know, it just like clicks open. Um, or it feels like, um, I mean, I, I don't have this talent, but I really admire people that can sing. And it feels a little bit like, you, you know, what I imagine it would feel like if you could sing, like that, it, that your voice sounds better than it does in, in everyday life. And, um, and I think that that's when you're closest to writing in your own voice. Um, it's a little bit better than how you, you think you could have done it. <laughs> I love that. And often it's a lot weirder. Like often yeah. it's like my idea of what I might write is, is not anywhere near as weird as what I write if I'm following my, my voice. There's something, 
you know, sort of irreducibly strange, I think, about when you're writing in your own register. Yeah. Maybe when you, when you think, wow, this is weird, then you can go, oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> like, yeah. And I mean, I think I that's just... for being a teacher of writing for so many years. It's like, I've also just objectively noticed that when my students are writing something, often there'll be this one passage that's really noticeably uh, good and better than what else is there. And they often are like, oh, really? I put that in, but it seems so weird. I almost took it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I sometimes remember like myself, like, oh, well, let's at least leave it here for a little bit, this weird thing. Yeah. So. Um, an MFA student would like to know uh, if you can offer some advice on protecting your writing time and seeing yourself through to finish your manuscript. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm totally uh, a not a legitimate person to talk about this right now because I've not protected my writing time at all during the pandemic. But in general, How can um, you? when I think you're, you're working on your manuscript, uh, the most important thing you can do is, um, is try to live cheaply around other people that are also doing serious work and living cheaply so that, you know, because the more that you have to, and also, you know, it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of true. Like, just let everyone think you're a failure. Like, let everyone think it's not working. And, and because of that, you'll have more time. Um, if you have to lead a completely double life versus, you know, you have some, something that you're using as your job that keeps you afloat. But, um, but I just realized that, like, a friend of mine gave me a really good idea, and I will pass it along which is, he said that you should have, if you're trying to get writing done, that you should make a day that's like a domestic dump day. And anything that you have to do that is, um, like if you have to go to Target or whatever you have to do like that, he's like, that goes on that day. A doctor's appointment goes on that day. And lunch goes on that day if you're gonna see someone. Because lunch is so disruptive to writers. It's like a nightmare when people wanna go to lunch. And so, <laughs> um, and then he's like, but make the writing day like, no. Like no one can, I'm not doing anything that day. And you always say no on that day. And, and for a long time for me, it was only like half a day or one day a week. But it, it, it gave a sense of kind of like, oh, this matters. I think that's why artist colonies are so useful for people because there's this whole infrastructure to be like, oh, you should write. It's, a, it, you know, people, I mean, I write incredibly well at places like that because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's like- Yeah, me too. I mean, whatever. It's, I guess it's like how Proust wrote, you know, when he had servants bring him things in his cork line room. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm always the one who's like, don't talk to me. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to skip dinner. And also, like, I do have to turn off my, I do have to turn off the internet. Mm -hmm. or work yes. somewhere and have internet. I mean, I, I don't, I know, you know, I thought, I don't know whose brain is strong enough to resist the gambling machine mechanism of, <laughs> of the internet, you know, but I, I, if I have it, I'll be like, oh, I'll see if I spin, see if I get the cherries, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wh wh for whoever asked that question, turn off the internet. You, yeah. you must. And read when um, you can't write. I think yeah. it's a good, good thing too, I try to do. I like the domestic dump day though. I, my solution was just, I had to not work at home. Yeah. Even oh, though I didn't yeah. have a, anywhere to go necessarily, I had to make a place to go because For otherwise I'll do the laundry. Like turtle, Cause I would always like have my backpack and I was always trying to find somewhere that I could be like usually a library. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked for a long time at Brooklyn college library. Um, or like I would learn, I would just work, I would work, I can't work in a cafe. I'm too distracted by other people, but I could work in a library, but I was always like carrying this heavy backpack with me all the time because if I was home, I, I, I couldn't work very well. And now I'm working in a trailer that somebody, um, left and it's very, very cold. Um, but I have an electric blanket and there's some electricity. So alert, there. I wear my hat and my coat and my fingerless gloves because there's no That's internet. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a good, that's a really good way of doing it. I'm usually just, I try and lose my password wherever I can or like oh, refuse it. Um, that's smart. Uh, someone would, oh, hi. Hi, you can keep going. I just okay. <laughs> don't, no need to cut off. I'm going to just back on. Do you want to yeah, do one more? Good. 
Yeah, we'll do one more. Um, how about this one? Uh, the novel, so this person wants to know, the novel centers on a character who hosts a podcast. And are there other mediums or artists that inspire your writing? Do you take inspiration from the rhythms of films or the white space in the work of visual artists or any other kinds of artists? Yes, I am, I am perpetually jealous of other artists and other art forms. And I'm always trying to figure out um, something. I mean, film, absolutely. I, I went on a huge like Chris Marker kick um, and I'm always like liking to watch documentaries. Um, Stand-up comedy, like I'm really interested in particularly like Maria Bamford and how she talks about like, uh, like mental health stuff in her comedy. Um, and then music. I mean, I feel like sometimes I just, <clears throat> sometimes I, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to music and I'll think to myself, I can't believe I wrote a whole novel and that person just wrote like a song that was like <laughs> all that you needed to, to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right when I, at the like six year mark of, of this novel, I remember I was like riding along in the car and I, I just put on some like old, I don't know. So I just had some old playlist and I, I listened to this like old dinosaur junior song. And it was like the, the chorus of it repeated over and over was, I feel the pain of everyone. And then I feel nothing. And I was like, okay, so that's my whole book. <laughs> but I, but I took 200 pages to say it. I love that you had the Alex Chilton quote in the beginning of yours. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I, Star. I stars are really good. Uh, I always like, oh, I'd like to write a song that was like that. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he could write a whole novel about one of those songs. But then when um, they write a novel, it's usually not, it, I don't know. I feel like maybe it doesn't carry those, I, like, just like I probably couldn't write a song. Yeah. Or you probably, could. As if I could, as if there's any chance. <laughs> that I could. <laughs> no, I probably could. No, maybe I could. <laughs> um, but you also like probably couldn't write like a, that big huge opus of a the like muscular novel because it's just like in those songwriters they there's just a way that they the language they interpret the world and the words that they have the access to and it's i just, just love a, the compression yeah. though i love the compression yeah. of, of, of like music so yeah mm -hmm. I'm, I'm constantly looking at that kind of stuff and um yeah, that was, that was a fun thing before the pandemic. My daughter got old enough to like want to go to museums and things with me. We would go to Mass Mocha and it was, it was awesome. That's so fun. Yeah. Some, someday soon. Someday soon, right? Yeah, well, I, uh, I loved weather and I'm so glad that we could talk about it. Um, I think we're probably, time is up. I mean, there's... Yeah, I mean, you know, now is a fine stopping point. Um, but um, this was wonderful. Uh, this was such a great discussion. And I love your work, Jenny. And thank you so much for leading an amazing discussion, Diane. Oh. Um, and thank you, everyone, for the questions. Um, I especially yeah, thank you. The Thanks questions. for coming. And it was, it was a real treat to get to talk to you, Diane. It's, fu it's fun. You know, when you read someone's work and you feel a little bit like you, you know, it's almost like a conversation and then it's, it's exciting to get to actually talk to the person. Yeah, yeah agreed. Right. Well, yeah. thank you all for coming and thank you Community Bookstore. Um, and everybody go shop at Community Bookstore, if not for our books, for some other fantastic book. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have a good night, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.